Hi everyone, good Wednesday afternoon and welcome to Go Local Live. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. Thanks for tuning in for some news and politics this afternoon. We've got a number of great guests for you. And kicking off this afternoon is General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Treasurer, thank you for joining us. Thanks today. for having me. Good to be back. I appreciate it. Here in the heyday of summer, it seems like the end of General Assembly session was quite some time ago, but want to kick off with one piece that uh, went through this past year. That is the Student Loan Bill of Rights recently signed into law by Governor Raimondo. So let's talk a little bit about that. We covered the issue throughout the year, but again, folks watching now say, tell me a little bit more about what this entails. Yeah, we're excited about this one. So um, as I think everybody watching knows, there is a growing student loan crisis in this country and in this state, and it's having really profound effects on our economy, right? People who have student loans and are having a hard time keeping up with their payments are less likely to start a business, less likely to buy a house, more likely to put off major life events like getting married. You know, that has an impact on the hospitality industry here in Rhode Island. And so there really are economic repercussions from the student loan crisis all throughout our state. And one of the factors driving this crisis is bad behavior in the student loan servicing industry. Mm -hmm. So the student loan servicers, these are not the lenders, these are the, the collectors, right? The debt collectors, the ones that process the payments out of your bank account. Mm -hmm. And this is a poorly regulated industry nationally. Uh, there are countless instances of student loan servicers, uh, either willfully or through negligence, um, messing up people's payments, mm. right? Drawing the wrong amount, doing it at the wrong time, charging people double, missing payments, causing people to you know, have their credit scores dinged, causing people to accidentally default on their loans, not educating people about loan assistance programs that they're legally entitled to. And so what the Student Loan Bill of Rights does is ensure basic consumer protections for student loan borrowers, basically saying that if you're a student loan borrower, you have a right to have the, wrong, the, the right amount drawn from your bank account and, and the right timing and to be educated about what the best options for you in terms of a repayment plan. There are a lot of student loan borrowers who are trying to do the right thing, who are trying to pay off their loans every month like they're supposed to and through no fault of their own are uh, being put into dire situations. So that's what the Student Loan Bill of Rights is going to address in Rhode Island. There are only a handful of other states that have done this so far, so we are among the first, and we're very excited about it. So tell us a little bit about the resources that need to be available through the office, because now that this is in law, yeah. again, if folks have issues with their student loans, I imagine saying, hey, I think I heard the treasurer say something on Go Local Live. I seem to be having a problem. Do you anticipate having to allocate you know, dedicated resources in your office to help those folks? Because yeah. let's be honest, a lot of folks have student loans. Yeah, so one of the great things about this legislation is that now finally people will have a place to call. So if you feel that your student loan servicer has done something wrong, has drawn the wrong amount, has mistimed your payments, has miscalculated your progress toward repayment, mm. which is very common, uh, you will be able to call the Consumer Protection Unit at the Attorney General's office. Okay. Um, they, over the next couple months, are going to be trained in how to handle these student loan cases. So the jurisdiction lies there. Exactly, right. The Consumer Protection Unit at the Attorney General's office. And we housed it there because uh, they already have a Consumer Protection Division. Mm -hmm. We don't want to have to, you know, duplicate an office somewhere else when there's already an office that is equipped to do that. Uh, so we're in the process of building out that capacity there at the AG's office. Uh, the Attorney General has been a great partner in this issue. Uh, he's been a, a partner and, and an advocate. So uh, if you're having trouble with your student loans in Rhode Island with your servicers, you will have a place to call. And what are the repercussions? Again, if you find that you have issues with your servicer, you end up going to the Attorney General's office, they find that uh, there was an actor in bad faith. I mean, what action can the Attorney yeah. General's office take uh, from a, a more global perspective? Yeah. So they can sue the servicers, they can seek restitution, they can refer the matter to DBR, the Department of Business Regulation, which will have the ability to investigate and levy fines as well. Um, they'll have uh, also... Uh, uh, the borrower has what's called a private right of action, which makes it easier for the borrower to sue the servicer if the servicer has done something wrong. Okay. So there's a range of new enforcement powers that are available, but also this is about education. And mm. so as part of this, uh, our office, along with the Attorney General's office, will be rolling out education programs 
to let people know their rights as student loan borrowers and again to make sure that they know where to call if they think that they have an issue. And if it's that private action, if that individual can sue the servicer, uh, do they need other additional legal representation? Are the resources there to help them? And probably what's already sort of a cash-strapped environment if they're saying, hey, I really need to fight this because a, it's unfair, and B, possibly illegal. Yeah. So again, the Attorney General's Office will have the ability uh, to work with borrowers and loan servicers to mediate or negotiate settlements in okay. some cases. Uh, but in addition to that, if the borrower wants to go further, um, they have the right to do that now. So let's talk a little bit uh, about education. Of course, the $250 million school construction bond this past election cycled. Give us an update as to where things are with that. Well, this is really exciting. Um, I feel like I was here a lot last year uh, uh, promoting the school construction bond and trying to get people to vote for it in the General Assembly and then in the public. Um, the good news is now we can stand here. The plan has been approved, approved by the General Assembly, approved by 77% of the voters, and we're off and running. Uh, every child deserves to go to a school that is warm and safe and dry and equipped for 21st century learning. And we are about to embark on an unprecedented amount of school construction activity in Rhode Island. So the $250 million bond was part of it, um, but that's part of a larger program. Uh, we're looking at uh, nearly $2 billion that's going to be spent over the next five to seven years repairing schools all across the state. Some of it has already started. There's going to be uh, a ribbon cutting for the new middle school in Barrington uh, that's opening this fall. Uh, there's work going on at the Lincoln High School, uh, a major renovation. There's a new high school being built in East Providence. Um, but there's much more to come uh, all across the state of Rhode Island. City of Providence is going to be a big part of it. And it's important not just because of you know, the right that students have to be safe in school, but this will also be an important catalyst for our economy in the long term. If we want to give students the opportunity to succeed in the 21st century workforce, we need to make sure that they have science labs, that they have career tech facilities that are up to date. And so this is going to be very exciting, I think. Um, the work is already beginning. The big surge will begin next summer. Okay. A lot of these projects are still sort of in the design phase, but um, you're seeing some work being done, some shovels in the ground already, and then I think at this time next year, you're going to see that ramp up statewide in a really significant way. And so you mentioned a few of the schools already getting addressed with their needs. Let's talk, I know we've discussed this before, but of course parents, family, students who might be watching saying, hey, I go to a school that's definitely in some need of repairs. Let's talk a little bit about that process, about how schools approach the state said that this is what they were looking for with assistance yeah. and then again how might folks know when their school might be in that list and how that was decided so one of our guiding principles in this whole program was that any decision about what kind of work to do whether to renovate a school or replace it or consolidate or whatever uh, should be local decisions this should not be the state coming in and telling local communities what they have to do. So if you're a parent or a student and you're concerned about the condition of your school building, the first thing to do is to talk to your elected officials, your town council, your city council, your mayors and administrators, because that's where the plans are really born. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, more than 20 school districts have already stepped forward and gone to the State Department of Education and indicated that they're planning some major school construction work as a result of this program. Okay. So more than 20 school districts are in that process. Um, that's a big number. And uh, again, it's all across the state, urban, rural, suburban. A number of these projects have already been approved. Uh, we've already approved um, nearly $300 million for Providence. Uh, we've approved, obviously, the East Providence High School, Lincoln, Barrington, others. Um, but there are many more school districts that are in the pipeline working their way through that planning process. And again, I think the bulk of the activity is going to begin next summer. So let's talk a little bit about a report recently released by the office. This is debt affordability in the state. Speaking of infrastructure and responsible borrowing, uh, of course, looking out with uh, cities and towns, uh, fiscal capacities, and even statewide as well, to be borrowing moving forward. Give us a holistic look about yeah. what the, the landscape looks like. Well, first of all, it's important that we continue to make these investments in repairing our infrastructure and making our state more economically competitive. Um, that's an important part of how 
we grow the economy in the long run is making sure that we're fixing our schools, our roads, our bridges, our ports. Uh, so we will and we should continue to do bonding for those big capital projects. But at the same time, we need to make sure that we know what the appropriate limits are so that we don't overextend ourselves and borrow too much. Mm. So that's why we released the debt affordability report uh, last week. This is the second time that we've released a comprehensive debt affordability study for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, what we basically found was that the borrowing for the state and most of the cities and towns is well within acceptable levels. So we can afford to have some bonds on the ballot statewide again in next year's election. Most of the cities and towns also are well below what we consider to be um, the danger zone when it comes to borrowing, so they have capacity. We did find uh, seven cities and towns that had liabilities that were higher than what we recommend as, as the ideal levels. In most cases, though, with those cities and towns that were above those recommended limits, it actually wasn't traditional bonded debt that was the problem, it was pension liabilities. So what I would encourage uh, all municipalities to do is look at the report, look at the information, and I think the lesson for each city and town and each issuer will be different. But at a high level, the good news is most of the cities and towns and the state have capacity to do more so that we can continue to invest in these important projects to build our economy. And let's talk a little bit about a program that is something that your office uh, likes to highlight, and this would be the Bank Local Program. We've spoken about this on the show. But again, after this assembly session, give us a snapshot of where things are at with being able to borrow local money here. Yeah. So small business is vital to Rhode Island's economy. Uh, we're a small state, so small business is a big deal. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs that have the talent and the drive and the desire to expand their small businesses and to hire more people. But sometimes they have a hard time getting the loans approved uh, to finance those expansions. And the research shows that a small business is twice as likely to have its loan application approved by a community bank or a credit union, uh, as opposed to one of the larger banks. And so under the bank local program, we are moving millions of dollars of the state's cash, our taxpayer money, to local community banks and credit unions to support their small business lending. Uh, we've talked about this program before. I know that uh, some of these local banks and credit unions that we work with are also uh, sponsors here at Go Local. Um, I can give you an update that uh, at this point we've moved nearly $30 million of our money back home to Rhode Island community banks and credit unions and supported more than 230 small business loans. Uh, these are loans to restaurants, to hair salons, even small manufacturers. Uh, so the program's going well, and we're going to continue to look for opportunities to expand it going forward. Okay, a little snapshot of where things are at with the office. Again, here in August, as you talked about uh, rolling out the school construction uh, bond money and uh, working with cities and towns with that, what can we expect from the office in the latter half of the year? Yeah, so we're continuing to push forward on all these initiatives, spending a lot of time working with the cities and towns on their school construction plans, uh, spending time again on, on Bank Local. Um, one thing that uh, we will be doing this fall is redoubling our efforts to return missing money, unclaimed property to Rhode Islanders, so keep an eye out for that. Um, and then we'll be forming our plan for uh, next spring as we get uh, further into the year. But my priority as treasurer has always been to find ways, creative ways, to use the office to help contribute to the economic recovery in Rhode Island. So that's going to continue to be uh, our primary area of focus going forward. Well, I appreciate your taking the time to come here into the studio for an update on Go Local Live for our viewers. General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Thank, thank you very much. much. We'll be back at 4 o'clock with more local news and politics, so be sure to catch us when we pop back up again. We look forward to seeing you shortly. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel.